In this video, I'll be discussing bond and molecular polarity. Our objective is to determine whether a specific molecule will be polar or nonpolar. It will be helpful to remember from a previous video the difference in these various bond characterizations. One type of bond we've discussed is a nonpolar bond, which has a very small difference in electronegativity between the two atoms. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have an ionic bond, which is a transfer of electrons due to a very great difference in electronegativity. In the middle, we have polar covalent bonds, and that's what we'll be discussing now. In this type of bond, it's important to remember that electrons are shared, but they're shared unequally because one atom has a higher electronegativity than the other. For this type of polar covalent bond, it's possible to represent the distribution of electrons using something called a bond dipole. A bond dipole is a vector that involves representing the partial negative charge given by this delta negative symbol and the partial positive charge given by this delta positive symbol. The negative charge is associated with the more electronegative atom, because, and that means that it has more electron density on that side of the bond. This dipole moment is an arrow, which has uh, crossed on one end. I remember this as being the positive end because it correlates with the partially positive. And on the other end, the arrow points towards the partially negative end. And this be is because it part points toward the more electronegative atom. Now, because this is a vector, the larger the, the dipole moment is, it means that the dipole is stronger, meaning there's a less equal sharing of electrons. One atom has a much greater electronegativity than the other. Now, we can apply this same reasoning to entire molecules. Polar molecules have an uneven distribution of electrons, and this means that the way that the electrons are distributed amongst the molecule, the atoms in the molecule, are non-symmetric. Conversely, nonpolar molecules have a symmetrical distribution of electrons, leading to a symmetric electron density. To determine whether a molecule will be polar or nonpolar, we can apply three steps. The first is to determine the electronegativity difference between all atoms that are in the molecule to allow us to draw individual bond dipoles. Once we do that, we can add the bond dipoles together. If they cancel, we'll have a, a symmetric electron density or a nonpolar molecule. If they don't cancel, we'll have a polar molecule, meaning the electron density is non-symmetric. Let's try this out. Here's a common molecule, carbon dioxide. Let's apply the steps. First, determine the electronegativities between the atoms in the bond. This type of molecule, or this molecule, has two carbon-oxygen double bonds. So what we need to do is determine the electronegativity difference between carbon and oxygen. By doing this, you'll notice the electronegativity difference is 1, which means that the carbon-oxygen bond is polar. This means that there's an uneven sharing of electrons within each one of these carbon-oxygen bonds. Now we need to represent this uneven sharing by bond dipoles. Here are the bond dipoles for each bond. Notice that the po po partially positive end is pointing toward the carbon in each case, and the partially negative end is pointing toward the oxygen. This is because the oxygen is the more electronegative atom. Now we can add the vectors together. We do this via a, a vector addition, which requires tip to tail addition. This means we line up the tip of one vector with the so-called tail of the other. In this case, because the vectors are equal and in opposite direction, the bond dipoles cancel. If we look at an electrostatic potential map of carbon dioxide, you'll see that there's symmetric electron distribution where each oxid, the more yellow orange colors represent more electron density and the blueish color and green represent less electron density. So we have more electron density on these partially negative oxygens 
and less on this partially positive carbon. Now let's look at an example of a polar molecule. We'll apply the same steps. First, we have to calculate the electronegativity difference between the atoms, in this case, hydrogen and oxygen. Doing so yields a value of 1.4, which means that the oxygen-hydrogen bond is polar. If we draw the bond dipoles, we'll draw them pointing toward the less, or from the less electronegative atom, which is the hydrogen, toward the more electronegative atom, which is the oxygen. It will become clear in a minute why I made these dipoles different colors. So when we go to add the dipoles up, you'll notice that they do not cancel. So we al align the tail of one vector, in this case the blue vector, with the tip of the other vector, the red vector, and you'll notice that there's this whole area here that doesn't have, that, that's kind of the result of this tip to tail addition. And this is called the bond dipole, or excuse me, the molecular dipole. So if we were to draw this molecular dipole on a water molecule, you'll notice that it goes right through the middle of the molecule, kind of piercing through this oxygen uh, in this tetrahedral electron geometry and bent molecular geometry. So in this case, because the bond dipoles don't cancel, we have this net molecular dipole. And this is also manifested in the electrostatic potential map, which shows the elect asymmetric um, electron distribution. More electrons in this partially negative end up toward the oxygen, and less electron density more in this partially positive end down by the hydrogens. Now pause the video and try out this practice problem to classify the bonds in the molecule BH3 as polar or nonpolar. Once you've done that, determine if BH3 is a polar or nonpolar molecule. Let's start by drawing the Lewis structure of BH3. Remember, B boron is an exception to the octet rule and requires six electrons around it. So therefore, this is the proper Lewis structure for the molecule BH3. Now let's calculate the difference in electronegativity between boron and hydrogen. When I did this, I got that the difference in electronegativity was 0.1. This means that boron, the boron-hydrogen bond is actually nonpolar, although there is a very small difference in electronegativities between the atoms. If you were to indicate this with a vector, you'd use very tiny vectors to indicate that there's only a slight electron density difference between the boron and hydrogen within this bond. Now, one important consequence of having a molecule that has only nonpolar bonds is that the molecule itself must also be nonpolar. There's no way to have a polar molecule that only has nonpolar bonds. Now, we can prove this when you add these bond dipoles together, they cancel. We can zoom in here and they kind of create this closed loop. So they're all pulling in equal and opposite direction on those 120 degree bond angles present in the trigonal planar geometry. So this again suggests that the whole molecule is nonpolar. Now pause the video and try this, uh, this additional practice problem to determine the molecular polarity of these two molecules, CF4 and CH3F. We'll follow the same steps, first calculating the electronegativity difference. In the left-hand molecule, CF4, there's only one type of bond, which is the carbon-fluorine bond. Determining the difference in electronegativity between carbon and fluorine yields that this bond is polar with an electronegativity difference of 1.5. The more electronegative atom is fluorine, so drawing bond dipoles means that the bond dipoles will point toward the carbon to the fluorine. Now, if you added these bond dipoles up, which gets a little trickier with the tetrahedral geometry because you have to follow the bond geometry, in other words, the the bond dipoles are all approximately 109.5 degrees from each other. But if you did this, you would notice that 
they would all cancel because they're effectively pulling in equal and opposite directions. We can see this on the electrostatic potential map, which shows a symmetric distribution of electrons within the molecule. This means that the molecule is nonpolar, even though it contains polar bonds. Now let's look at our other molecule, CH3F. There are two kinds of bonds here. One is the CF bond, which we've already determined, and one is the CH bond. The CH bond is effectively nonpolar, meaning that the difference in electronegativity is 0.4 or less. As we calculated for the other molecule, the CF bond is polar. If we were to draw bond dipoles on this molecule, they'd look something like this. A large bond dipole, indicated here, between carbon and fluorine, because this bond has a strong difference in electronegativity between carbon and fluorine and very tiny bond dipoles on the carbon and hydrogen bonds indicating a small difference in electronegativity between these atoms. If we were to add these up, they would, and which again is a little trickier for these tetrahedral electron geometries, but you'll notice that the fluorine here, shown toward the top of the molecule, is generally pulling electron density towards itself. Um, or from the carbon to the fluorine, the fluorine that has this kind of excess of electron density where the what's currently shown as kind of this bottom part of the molecule is showing a, a lack of electron density. The electrostatic potential map makes this very clear, showing a large region of high electron density toward the fluorine end of the molecule and a relatively lower electron density toward this bottom hydrogen end of the molecule. In this video, we've discussed and showed a few examples of how to classify molecules as being polar or nonpolar based on their geometry and the polarity of their bonds. For some extra practice, try out these problems where you draw the Lewis structure for these four molecules, classify each bond as being polar or nonpolar, and then classify the molecule as a whole as polar or nonpolar by adding the bond dipoles. Good luck with that, and I'll see you in the next video.